Hi, thanks for coming. Uh, this talk will be more about the research on web security. SSRF is an attack technique on web application. The first concept of SSRF was found 10 years ago. Since then, many exploitations and mitigations were developed. Nowadays, the old school vulnerability like SQL injection, sorry, like SQL injection or local file inclusion in modern web applications become fewer and fewer. But you still can find SSRF in large enterprises like Google, Twitter, or Facebook. In this talk, I will show you some of my findings. These findings are not only able to bypass existing SSRF protections, but also lead to, but also lead to critical remote code execution. Also, we will give case studies in real web applications and a demo on GitHub Enterprise. Okay, let's go. Hi again, I'm Orange from Taiwan. We speak Mandarin Chinese, and I think most Japanese know where Taiwan is. As you can see, my English is not good, but I will try my best to give this talk. Thank you for stay, staying here and bearing with me. I have just got my MS degree and work in a security startup. I'm a vulnerability researcher in DevCore. My job is to study new te techniques and find zero day in not only web, but also binary. So I can do reversing stuff, binary exportation, but my favorite is still web security. I'm also a member of ChangeLoot and HitCon. ChangeLoot is a hacker group, and we hold the largest hacker conference, HitCon, in Taiwan. By the way, HitCon Pacific, Pacific will take place on December 8 and 9. Welcome to join us. Here is a brief introduction of myself. I'm a speaker at several conferences like Black Hat, DEF CON, UUN, and AV Tokyo. I'm also a CTF player, participated last of CTF competition all over the world. The last but not least, I'm a bug bounty hunter. In web security, I love server-side vulnerability more than client-side. To take control of a server is more fun for me. So I love remote code execution in particular. And you can see what vendors I report remote code execution to. Everyone loved cats, right? This is our agenda today. Our goal is to make SSI great again. First, I will introduce SSRF and start with some quick fun examples. And next, I will talk about my findings in both an attack surface on SSRF bypass and a new attack vector in protocol smuggling that enhances the existing SSRF. By combining this, we can achieve more advanced exploitation or compromise the server. Of course, we will have case studies and demo. Okay, what is SSRF? This is a technical, this is a technical talk, not SSRF 101. So I will not talk about lots of trivial introductions. I suppose you all know what SSRF is. SSRF in a world, it can bypass the firewall and touch your intranet. So the attack surface is dependent on how big your intranet is. The larger your enterprise is, the more robust SSRF will be. For example, in a big company, 
they are lots of just two radius elastic you can point by SSRF. And next, protocol smuggling in SSRF. It makes SSRF more powerful. There are several ways to smuggle protocols in a SSRF, and each way has its limitation. So, what protocols is good to smuggle? I have a list here, and you can check. Okay. Our introduction part is over, short, right? Before we start our topic, I want to make a survey. Okay, how many people use Python? Please raise your hand. Wow, so much. I want to ask you a question. If you want to access the web with Python, which library do you prefer? I think the most Python guys use request is urllib or urllib2. Let's start with a fun example. Think about this URL. The red square is the space. So which address Python is going to access? You have five seconds to put the answer in your mind. Do you have the answer? Okay. Okay, here is the answer. Actually, even Python's built-in libraries treat the same URL differently. URLlib access the blue part, and the URLlib2 access the orange part. But the green is request S. Very weird. It sounds crazy. Python is real, real hard. I don't understand Python. Another showcase, it is easy to understand if there is a CRLF injection in HTTP and we can smuggle other protocols. But as you can see, for the security concern, most of SNTP server Block the HTTP connection. If server, if the SNTP server find the HTTP pattern, such as get slash or post slash in the incoming request, the server will cut off the connection. So SNTP has HTTP protocol, and it seems unexploitable. Somebody might say, you can use Gopher. We are not going to talk about Gopher today. Gopher is good, but what if there is no Gopher support? Gopher is too easy, easy to block, and not all programming language support Gopher. But in a SSRF, the HTTP always exists, so we focus so we focus on the attack scenario under HTTP and HTTPS. Let's smuggle SNTP protocol over HTTPS. HTTPS is a secured protocol. So the payload, so the attack payload will be encrypted. So how? Let's think about a question. What won't be encrypted in a SSL handshake? Okay, the answer is SNI, server name indication. We can send a HTTPS request on, on port 25 to bypass the limitation. Smarter SNTP over SSL, SNI, I think no one mentioned this before. During the SSL connection, the hello messenger will be the handshake that exchanges the metadata 
between the server and the client. And that is the SMI extension, which specif specific the remote host name in this message. So, what if we can disrupt the host name? Yes, the yellow square. This space makes it possible to embed malicious payload in the domain name. So, you can see with the space, we can now inject new lines and data in the domain name. Okay, why this works? We used a trick in Linux glibc, and we will introduce later. The data separated by new lines is SNTP protocol with Smart Our command simply requests the SNTP server to send a mail. This is the request and the response in plain text. You can see there is no, there is no HTTP pattern such as get slash or post slash here. And the server still recognizes our payload as a valid command. So we exploit the unexploitable successfully. These two examples are interesting, right? Okay, let's go to our main content. Yeah, make SSI great again. Today, we prepared four sections to make SSI great again. The first part, URL passing issues. This is all about the inconsistency between the URL passer and the URL requester. It is common to fix a, a SSRF by validating the URL. But validating a URL is a hard work. Why? The spec of URL is defined in IFC 3986, but only spec without implementation guidelines. HotWG is a community trying to define a modern implementation based on RFC. But in fact, programming languages still prefer their own implementation more. So there are lots of mistakes on URL passes. How RFC define a URL? This is the URL component defined in RFC 3986. There are totally five paths, skin, authority, path, query, and fragment. And this is what we will cover today, the skin, authority, and path. For the skin, we only care about the text scenario on the HTTP and HTTPS. For the authority and path, they are too complex to understand, and we will take a look later. Finally, as the query and the fragment, mm, I don't care. This is the big picture of the problems we will mention today. We classify the URL passing issue into three types, pull injection, host injection, and pass injection. So does protocol smuggling, smuggling on pass, post, and smuggling on SNI. Consider the following code in PHP. The code simply fetches the user provider URL. In order to prevent SSRF, developers use the function pass URL to check whether the host and poll are valid or not. So if you provide 127.0.0.1 and poll 81, you will not pass the check. But how about this URL? Everyone knows colon is the separate between the host and the port. IFC defined the spec but didn't say how to implement. So 
will the colon be interpreted from the front or the back? It is interesting. For this URL, the PHP function past URL recognized AT as poll number. But actually, PHP read file fetches the poll number 11211. Both past URL and read file are the built-in functions in PHP, but their behaviors are very distinct. So we can use this inconsistency to bypass the check. And how about this URL? Google.com number sign at avo.com. This is another interesting case. Pass URL will recognize Google.com as hostname, but the read file fetches avo.com. This URL perfectly bypasses all the restrictions, but are you curious about which behaviors is the right one? Okay, I think the domain avo.com already told you the answer. Several programming languages suffered from this issue, like PHP, Java, Curl, and Python. According to the IFC, the authority, uh, the authority part is preceded by a double slash and is terminated by the next slash, question mark, or a number sign. So the appropriate authority part is google.com. Okay, if you don't like PHP, let's explore curl. Curl is a world famous library and there are lots of language bindings. Think about how curl interpreted this URL. Foo at avo.com, pod80 at google.com. Most parsers recognize google.com as the valid hostname, but curl fetches avo.com. The inconsistency between the parser and curl will also lead to security problems. I think we all agree that curl is a world famous library with lots of language bindings. Therefore, if an application use its passing library to check the URL, but fetch the resource by curl. It might be vulnerable. This is very common in PHP because PHP built-in HTTP library sucks. <laughs> There's a tiny delay for the interpreter. <laughs> After I find this problem, I quickly report to the curl security team, and their reply is in no time. But while checking the patch, I find we can sim simply bypass the patch by an additional space. This is not a fault of curl. This also uses a feature in Linux glibc, and we will talk about later. However, I think curl can be more strict. So I report again, but this time, curl team replied, curl doesn't verify that the curl is 100% syntactically correct. It is instead documented to work with URL that assume that you pass correct input. Curl think this is a programmer's problem, so this won't be fixed. But previous patch still applied on curl 7.54. The next attack vector is about the Unicode failure on Node.js. Look at the following code. In order to prevent directory traversal, the code check there is no dot dot slash in the path. So you can't access the file outside the sandbox directory. The question is, if there is a password file on the web root, how to access the file? Does anyone have an idea? The answer is using the Unicode symbol 
full with n. This URL actually answers the file password on the web root. Okay, let's explain why. The JavaScript's internal process the Unicode string as encoding UCS2. So the Unicode symbol N will be represented in FF2E. And the tricky thing is the buffer string in HTTP module will fold the byte. And the FF will be stripped. And the remaining part is 2E, the ASCII of dot. The server will identify the dot dot slash as the parent directory. So we can download the password file on the web root from the remote server. The double full with n is the new dot dot slash in node says HTTP module. What the hell? I have nothing to say. This technique can be also applied on protocol smuggling. Originally, HTTP module prevents user from CRLF injection. The HTTP module will encode the new line as percent percent encoding. So if we inject new line in the path, our smuggling will fail. But we can break the protection by Unicode symbol FFCOD and FFCOA. The full with dash and the full with asterisk. The HTTP module cannot locate any new lines in the past, but output will fold the byte and street the FF. So our protocol smuggling reproduce again. Next section is about the feature on Linux glibc. First, this is a weird feature in NSS function get host by name. By looking the source of glibc, there is a com there is a comment here. Convert an ASCII string into an encoded domain name as per RFC 1035. But what is RFC 1035? The RFC 1035 descri des describes the detail of the domain system and protocol. But the surprise is the domain system supports decimal conversion in get host by name. You can see the C program, the result of OR backslash 097NGE.tw is equal to the result of orange.tw. I roughly grabbed uh, the Linux main patch, but I didn't find anything related to this weird feature. I think this may be useful when bypassing some blacklist protections. And the source code showed that get host by name will remove the backslash that is not followed by digit. That is also a good way to obfuscate your domain name with lots of backslashes. You can see I print out the host to show that the escaping process is done by get host by name. And the next feature is about the Linux get address info. Get address, get address info will strip trailing rubbish followed by a valid IP format and the white space. So you can see the C program, the domain 127.0.0.1 space FOO is valid and return the result of 
Get address info is a very fundamental function in Linux. For example, the function get host by name in Python second module relied on Linux get address info. So the CRLF FOO in the domain name will be removed. This makes it possible to do more complex attacks based on the based on the polluted domain name. Okay, let's talk about how to exploit NSS features on URL parsers. URL parsers might recognize all the authority part as hostname, but HTTP requests still fetch 127.0.0.1. The percent 25 Zero 9 is a special one and need more explanations. Why double encoding works? After digging the source, we find that libraries such as Perl decode the URL twice. So these patterns are useful when breaking some subdomain checks. Next, exploit NSS features on protocol smiling. First, why this works? This is because that HTTP protocol 1.1 require the ho a host header. And most of libraries embed hostname into HTTP requester. So the idea is if we can inject new lines in the hostname, we have the ability to smuggle protocol in HTTP. For example, the data with new line in the hostname will be recognized as a valid Redis command. You can see we smuggle the slab of command over the HTTP protocol. By the way, the slab of is a nice command that you can make outbound traffic. So this is a useful trick when you are facing some blind SSRF. SMI injection is also the same idea. During the SSL, the SMI extension will embed the host name in the hello messenger. So if we, if we inject new lines in the host name, we can find out the command in the encrypted messenger. Let's break the patch of the Python CVE 2016-5699. It's a CRF injection in the function put header of module HTTP lib. It also affects both URL lib and URL lib too because they use HTTP lib to construct their HTTP library, uh, to construct their HTTP request. Python use a regular expression to ensure there is no new line in the header. Otherwise, it will rest an error. But Python makes an exception of the tab and the space followed by the new line. So we can break the patch by a leading space. You can see with the space, the URL lib and URL lib2 are vulnerable again. But this brings out a new problem. There is one more leading space in our payload. Does protocol smuggling work on this way? The answer is yes. Thanks to the Redis and main cache. As you can see, the slate of comments start with a leading space and the server still replied okay. Redis and main cache will strip the leading space. So our exploit works again. Next attack vector is about the IDMA standard. IDMA defines the standard of Unicode in domain name system. There are two primary versions of IDMA, 2003 and 2008. But IDMA 2008 is too strict. So most of the parsers follow the IDMA 2003 with UTS-46 transition. 
The idea may suppose lots of weird unicode transitions. For example, the so-called alphabet will be recognized as a valid letter in domain name system. And the Unicode 200D zero with joiner will be removed in IDMA 2003. So if the parser and the requester adopt different IDMA standard, it might be a security concern. A very fun example is the Latin letter, small sharp s. This is a JavaScript example that you can run on your browser's consoles. You can see the symbol in lower case is, a, is a same as a, itself. But in upper case, it becomes the double capital S. And the redirection in browsers will go to wordpress.com. This is, this is very useful when breaking some blacklist. And we will give you a real case study later. Okay, cat studies. Let's study some real world cases. WordPress is a very famous web application and it paid lots of attention on SSRF. But we still find three different ways to bypass the protections. Bug has been reported several months ago but still unpatched. For the responsible disclosure process, I will use my BB as my case study instead. However, the, these techniques are very general. So I think you can use these techniques everywhere. These tables show which components WordPress, Vbleed, and my BB will use to treat a URL. The main concept of the bypass is finding different behaviors among the parser, DNS tracker, and the requester. If you find one, then you have the ability to bypass the restriction. This is the source code of my BB. The first bypass is not a new trick. It's type of track to type of use problem. My BB use pass URL to track whether the host name, skin, and poll are valid or not. And also use get host by name to resolve the domain, ensuring that the address is not in black, black, black list. Sorry. If the URL pass all the track, my BB will fetch the results by curl. The problem is the state of track and the state of use can be different. The state in line nine and the state in line 16 can be different. So we set out a DNA server and lead the first query to an non-black list address, such as 1.2.3.4. After we pass the track, my BB will fetch the URL and, and, the query, and query the domain again. At the moment, we change the DNS record to 127.0.0.1. The state in track is 1.2.3.4, but the state in use is 127.0.0.1, so that we can bypass the protection. The next bypass is about the support of IDMA standard. Curl is a, is a very intelligent library which can automatically convert the global domain name to an IP address but PHP get host by name can't. This inconsistency also lead to the SSRF bypass. You can see for the, for the URL, get host by name will return first and pass the trick, but the curl still fetches 127.0.0.1. 
the last bypass is the inconsistency between the parser and the requester. We mentioned several URL parsing bugs before. By using these bugs, we can bypass all the restrictions. For the number sign bug, the pass URL recognizes google.com as hostname, but the curl still fetches 127.0.0.1. This is handy, but has been fixed in PHP 127.0.0.13. If you don't like PHP, you can still exploit the bug in curl, and the result is the same. The bug is also fixed in curl 7.54, but most of the patches didn't keep up. For, ex for example, the lib curl in the latest version of Ubuntu is still 7.52.1. So I think most systems are still under threat. Or you can use the space technique we mentioned before. About this issue, curl won't fix. Okay, let's see our last case studies, GitHub Enterprise. GitHub Enterprise is a local version of GitHub that you can deploy a whole GitHub service in your private network. Most of the code are written in Ruby on Rails and obfuscated. The code base of GitHub Enterprise seems to be same as github.com. And they is an environment variable that you can switch the mode from enterprise version to the .com version. So if you want to study the security on GitHub, I highly recommend GitHub Enterprise to you. In this case, I will show you a beautiful exploit chain that turned full vulnerabilities into a critical remote code execution. It also won the best report in GitHub third bug bounty anniversary. While playing GitHub Enterprise, I noticed there is an interesting feature called Webhook. Webhook can define a custom HTTP callback when specific Git command occurs. And GitHub use Ruby Dream validity to fetch external resource and prevents users from SSI by Dream validity restrict IP addresses. The Dream seems to be just a simple backlist and can be bypassed by a zero. In Linux, the zero stands for localhost. So we got a SSI now. However, we still can't do anything. Why? There are several limitations in this SSIF, such as the, this SSI only allow the skin HTTP and HTTPS. And we can't change the skin by the 302 redirection. So you cannot use Gopher. This is also a post-based SSIF, and we can't even control the header or the post data. The most important thing is there is no CRF injection in this SSIF. So we have a SSIF, but with lots of limitations. My next idea is, is there any HTTP service we can leverage? It is a bit work. There are several language, uh, there are several services inside and each service based on different language implementation, like C, C++, Go, and Python. With a couple of days digging, I find there is a service called Graphite on port 8000. 
Graphite is a highly scalable and real-time graphing system. Of course, we find another SSI here. The second SSI is simple. Graphite just fetched the URL from the get parameter. So we have two SSI now, and we can combine these two SSI into a SSI execution chain. And we successfully switch a post-based SSI into a get-based SSI. The third bug is the CRF injection on GradFight. As you can see, the implementation of the second SSI is Python HTTP lib. Earlier, we mentioned that HTTP lib suffered from CRF injection. So with the CRF injection, we now have the ability to smuggle protocols in this SSI execution chain. However, the next problem is, what protocol did I choose to smuggle? I spent lots of time to find out what vulnerabilities can be triggered if I can control the Redis or main cache. While reviewing the source code, I'm curious about why GitHub can store Ruby object in main cache. After some digging, I find GitHub used a Ruby gene to store the cache, and the cache was wrapped by Marshall. It is a good news. Everyone knows Marshall is very dangerous. So our goal is very clear. We use our SSI execution chain to store malicious Ruby object in main cache. The next time GitHub fetches the cache, the Ruby gene will deserialize the data automatically. And the result is we got a remote code execution. Here is the final payload. There are several paths, and the red part is the first SSI bypass in webhook. Combined with the blue part, the second SSIF. The yellow is the main cache protocol with Margaret. And the final dark blue part is our malicious object. In this case, we execute the command id pipe nc orange.tw. One, two, three, four, five. In this case, award 12,500 US dollars from GitHub. I think this is a very practical case about the SSI execution chain and protocol smuggling in the world. Okay, let's watch the demo video, remote code execution on GitHub Enterprise. Oops. Ah. Oh. Okay, this is GitHub Enterprise. Very similar to GitHub.com, right? The version is 2.8.6. In order to add a webhook, we open our profile, repository, and the setting. Click hooks and services and add a webhook. Okay, here, here is our callback URL. We open our console. And we list our exploit file. and run the exploit.
Here is our SSI payload. We pass the payload to the GitHub Enterprise. Okay, when we submit the phone, the SSI execution chain will insert a malicious data to the main cache. Okay, we listen a port on 12345 and wait and wait for and wait for our shell back. We can search a keyword to trigger the RCE. Okay, we got a shell. So with the SSI execution train and the protocol smuggling over the main cache, we can execute arbitrary system command on remote server. Okay, maybe you know this talk also presented in Black Hat USA and DEF CON. After the presentation, some bug bounty hunters talked to me and said that they read my slides and successfully exploit my trick in some private bug bounty programs. Let's look their successful stories. Someone told me he filed a SSRF but he was unable to exploit this SSRF. After he read my slides, he know that he can smuggle protocols in HTTP host. So he, so now he know where is the next step. He used the trick to smuggle Redis protocol in SSRF, train with Java visualization data and achieve remote code execution. These stories say that my tricks are very useful in real world. Okay, mitigations. How to prevent such attacks in SSRF? We are from two aspects. For application layer, use the only IP to connect, and remember, don't reuse the URL that the user provided. For network layer, use firewall or network policy to block internal traffic. There are also projects that decide to prevent you from SSRF attacks. SafeCurl by Finite and Advocate by Jordan Mile. Okay, summary. First, we introduce a new attack service on SSI bypass, including the issues on URL passers and the inconsistency between the IED NA standard. Second, new attack vector on protocol smuggling. We showed that weird feature in Linux GDBC and the Unicode failure on Node says. These issues can inject malicious payload in a valid HTTP request to bypass the firewall and touch the internal service. The last, we give case studies on such Python, MyBB, and GitHub. Thanks for the following articles. They inspired me to do this research. And thanks to many, many people who helped me. This is the end of my presentation. If you have further questions, here is my contact information, orange at changeloot.org, or you can find me on Twitter, orange underscore AC61. I also post the whole story about the GitHub remote code execution on my blog, blog.orange.tw. Thanks for staying with me, thanks.